being part of this. Uh, I titled my message tonight, Where Talents and Burdens Collide and Passion is Made Perfect in, in Weakness. I'm going to start tonight's message in Habakkuk 2, 2 through 3. If you're not familiar with Habakkuk, I really wasn't either before I uh, you know, started digging into this message. It's a real short book at the very near end of the Old uh, Testament. I'm sure most of you were probably in Habakkuk this morning, you know, probably, uh, <laughs> Uh, preaching to the choir here but uh, anyway I want to start there I want to read this uh, this to you and then take you through what I did to decipher it and help understand it and and understand why it related to this to this message so uh, here's what it says and this is from the the ESV version and then I've got some notes I want to talk to speak to from the NLT which made it a little more understandable for for me more uh, relatable uh, write the vision, make it plain on tablets, so he may run who reads it. For still the vision awaits its appointed time. It has, hastens to the end. It will not lie. If it seems slow, wait for it. It will surely come. It will not delay. So in Habakkuk 2.2, 2, you know, God instructs the prophet to write the message, literally meaning plainly, so that it will be understood, preserved, and then share it with, with others. And then he goes on in three, uh, God's people, and, and says God's people must wait patiently, um, that the divine plan is, is on schedule, and understand that God's timing is just that. It's his timing, not, not ours. Um, when I looked into the message uh, and the meaning behind Habakkuk, when I dug a little bit further, it, it I found this out. It, it, I was told or read, read this, I should say. The faithful may be tempted to wonder whether God really cares or is really in control. Habakkuk's dialogue helps us to understand that God does not despise such questions when they are carried to him in prayer from an honest heart. I think I mentioned, you know, maybe recently for, for the past several months now, I've been, I've been job hunting. You know, I've, I'm at a place right now with a company that's very insecure and, and I don't like that. Um, and I need to, to, to find a different direction to make sure I have, you know, security in, in, in our household and, and accountable to what, you know, we need to, or for means to, to make sure we're taken care of. Um, and I've got to tell you, you know, the, the, the job market right now, the, the, navigating that market, particularly the interview process, is it's an emotional roller coaster. In I think, boy, I've probably been since last November interviewed with oh geez, half a dozen? Is it that half a dozen different mm -hmm. companies, of which like five of those, I made it down to the final candidate, um, or the, the final two candidates, I sh I should say, in each um interview process only to not get those jobs and it was grueling interviews you know these aren't the old days i remember of going and you meet with a store manager or, you know the district manager you sit down for a few hours and and ultimately you determine relatively quickly whether you know this is a fit for you and, and you move forward not anymore it's it's store level interviews it's district managers it's hr it's loss prevention it's uh, human resources. It's a complete grind and, uh, and, and very draining. For me though, one of the biggest challenges in this whole process was trying to figure out where to best utilize my talents. What did the workplace look like for me going forward? So as part of that process, as I had these conversations with Jennifer and, and try to navigate this, you know, I, I posed, um, or I, I should say, she posed to me the question, where does your talents slash passions um, meet your burden? So my answer to her is, as we've spoke before, and a lot of you know, it started the con that's how the conversation started tonight. My, my passion is, is fishing. My burden is when I don't catch enough. So my thought process was I need to fish more often. Um, 
Yeah, as you can see by Jennifer's <laughs> look, that isn't the direction that she was going with that. That isn't what she was what she was hoping to hear or what she was trying to get get out of me uh, with that question. It seemed logical to me. It seemed like the right thing. Um, but I'm gonna turn it over to her for just a minute and let her explain what she the direction she was really going with that uh, for me and helping me to to try and navigate this. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so when I work with my clients, a lot of times they struggle with hearing God's voice or, um, gosh, I don't know what God wants me to do and I've got choices and or not choices and I can't hear him. And, and so um, this question that I pose is actually from, I don't know if anybody knows Rebecca Lyons. Um, she's an author, speaker, blogger, wonderful. And this is her book, um, You Are Free. And in this book, uh, she talks a lot about her own journey with depression, anxiety, and God's calling on her life. And there's a chapter in here, and it asks, um, the chapter is entitled Free to be Called. And she said, as I unpacked my story and my unique gifts, I began to understand calling is where your talents and your burdens collide. Our talents are our birthright gifts, the gifts that make our hearts sing, come alive. Our burdens are found in our stories and what breaks our heart. God was inviting me to use the gifts that made me come alive to redeem the, the things that had broke my heart. Calling begins with the caller. What a relief. Calling isn't up to us. And I love that because sometimes we search so much for God's calling in our life and we not necessarily miss it, but we become frustrated when we don't hear him. And so I started, like I said, to ask this question to my clients and I changed it a little bit because sometimes we have a passion for something, but it may not be our talent. Now, I don't necessarily, this is not a good example, because for me personally, I'm not musically inclined. Um, but let's say I really wanted to learn how to play the saxophone, and that's where my passion was. I really wanted to bless people with music, but I'm not necessarily talented at it. And so it's not that you can't learn something, because as we know, God calls the, or doesn't call the equipped, he equips the called, right? And so I, for me personally, I changed that word to passion. And so what I mean by that, when I asked the question to Justin was not fishing, um, but I asked it, if you think about, um, for instance, and, and I don't mean for this to come across insensitive, but when you see the puppy commercials or the shelter commercials, for me personally, it, it, I have to turn it off because I just can't watch those commercials. They tug at my heartstrings in a totally different way Whereas someone else might look at that and it might burden their heart to the point where it makes them want to move. It makes them want to do something and adopt all those pets or send money or it makes them want to do something. So their burden or what tears at their heart or what God has placed on their heart is going to be different. Mine is I've known, it's been such a blessing for me, but I've known that I wanted to be a counselor since I was a freshman in high school. And for me, my my passion has been that for, gosh, however long I've been out of high school. Um, and then my uh, burden is really helping, especially women, um, but really helping them to find their identity in Christ. And for me, that just jazzes my heart when they can see how much God works in their life and how important they are and how worthy they are. That is, that's my burden. I love to see women explore and, and discover that. And so those two have collided beautifully into counseling. And so for me, it, it really has fit. So that's what I meant behind, <laughs> behind the question of where do um, your passion and your burden collide. And so one of our challenges later on is the, maybe just to be thinking about, gosh, where do, where do my burdens and my passions collide as Justin keeps talking? Okay, well, that should about wrap us up for tonight. I can go ahead and pray for us and <laughs> most of my sermon. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, so, you guys, do you ever have the feeling that that God put something on, on your heart, but the reality of the situation is that you were trying to make it God breathe. You wanted something. And so it was, it was truly your desire, but you're trying to attach it to God and make it seem like it came from, from him. So that just recently happened uh, to me. You guys are all probably thinking right now, oh yeah, I've, you know, I've done that. I've, I've been there. I can think of something right now. Um, but uh, you know, when I delivered my, my initial inaugural uh, message with, with Connect, um, I was encouraged by a lot of you to deliver another message and you know first off thank you um for being so supportive but so when i started the, the thought process of that i had an idea right away on, on what direction i wanted to to go 
I instantly thought, you know what, I've got an idea to spin off of uh, my gospel message, something I actually titled um, The Intercessor, to speak more specifically to a certain part of that. Um, I had actually written, gosh, at least half of that message um, already. I had already completed half that before I started to think that, you know what, I don't know that this is the direction God really wants for me. That kept that whisper kept coming into my into my ear, you know. And I was thinking, well, why did I choose this topic? I chose it because it was easy for me. It wasn't risky. I already had most of the material that I needed um, through researching my initial uh, message, so I could whip it together essentially with without a lot of effort. I had the material. I didn't need to um, invest more time researching and, and, and pulling this all together to, to be here tonight to, to present this. Um, the resounding thought though around that was that I felt very disconnected from God with that, with that um, message. I couldn't, I couldn't complete it because I knew it wasn't right. I literally, the room we're sitting in here right now, I paced around this room knowing that that's not what God wanted me to deliver. I was wrestling with him over that. And, uh, and, and who do you think won that? <laughs> I know all of you are on mute right now, so you can't say me, but I can see it in your faces that you knew that, you know, that, that, that battle was mine. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, it was at that time, precisely, I, I remember it, precisely and concisely that I was standing in here and that conversation Jennifer and I had months ago, that question she asked me resonated. And so I believe ultimately God was through that question speaking to me and directing me to talk to you all specifically about that tonight. Um, Nathan mentioned several weeks ago that there's a lot in putting together um, this message, regardless if it's for you know, five people or whether it's for, for 50, putting this all together, um, having a full-time job, balancing life and kids and everything. Um, it, it's a lot to do. And I don't say that as a means of saying, look at me, nor do I believe that's the direction Nathan intended that comment to go at all. Uh, I'm not saying, look what I have the ability to accomplish. That's not it. I'm saying this as, as a means to better help understand the, the message that, I, that I'm delivering. Um, this, this place God um, calls us to, where your deep passion and your, your burdens meet. It, I can tell you right now, I never saw myself um, giving a message. The reality of this is I'm not even very good at it yet. <laughs> right now I'm reading a book by Andy Stanley. It's, it's called, um, uh, do, 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 uh, communicate, communicating for change. Excellent book. Uh, it talks a lot about having just one concise point, something the audience can easily take away, you know, a, a title that that's capturing and easy to remember of which I already missed all of those, but, uh, you know, I'm continuing to, uh, to, to work on it when it comes to, to, you know, ministry and, and giving messages, you know, people say that they see something in me. Typically, I call those people mom or, or babe. <laughs> um, but I, I've been told not to sell myself short in, in this. Oftentimes, when I will talk um, with, in intimate conversations with people around ministry or, or doing these things, and they'll be very encouraging, or you know, when I deliver um, messages, maybe it's in our house group or, or here, Oftentimes I'll poke fun at myself and, and that, and I've been told, you know, don't sell myself short. I'm, I'm not selling my short self short. The reality of why I do that is to help explain my story, simply show the things that God's instilled in me and say, this is where I came from. Here I am now. So I can better paint the picture of what God's brought me through 
to it to where I am now and I think a lot of us have that have that story and that's just the means of how I do it I communicate it that way and I, I'm not ashamed of, of doing it that way and a lot of times I thought that I was doing things wrong but I think this helps make my story and how I portray or how I uh, how I portray our God is more relatable and I, I hope people find that because callings they're not they're not one size uh fits all it, it isn't limited to a strong feeling particular career or occupation it, it's rooted in god's creativity in us how he designed us our talents their birthrights um it's the gifts that make our hearts come alive our burdens are found in our story which breaks our heart i think jennifer mentioned some of that uh, some of us may be called to what others believe is thankless work but uh in god's wisdom it's exactly where he needs you to be it's exactly where he wants you I didn't want a calling. I didn't. Um, this part may be tough for me to say. And, you know, uh, but, uh, you know, I learned, I wanted success. I didn't want surrender. And I learned surrender through, <clears throat> excuse me, I, I learned surrender through crippling panic attacks. Um, you know, I, I, I try to be extremely candid in, you know, when I talk about where I came from. And there were times where I would shake so uncontrollably because of the, my body just needed to process the internal components of what I was feeling were coming out and I simply couldn't control it. I mean, that's how I learned, you know, to, to surrender. Um, you know, I was working through emotions that I hadn't processed for years and, uh, you know, trying to um, you know, work through all that. Uh, I learned surrender through tearful, painful prayer. Uh, but you know what? I'm finally starting to get it. I'm finally starting to, to, uh, understand. And, um, uh, what I've come to realize is, is God was inviting me to use the gifts, uh, that make me come alive to redeem the things that broke my heart. Um, he called me to participate with him in the redemption of the world. How powerful to have the assurance that I don't have to be perfect as part of God's great, perfect plan. In fact, he's working through my weaknesses, my struggles, my brokenness, um, because that's where I surrender and he's glorified. Uh, I'm going to have Jennifer read one of the first passages that ever spoke to me as, as a Christian was 2 Corinthians uh, 12, 9, 9 uh, and 10. When I became a believer uh, several years back, the first passage that I ever connected with and found, um, you know, uh, uh, found a means of digging deeper was, was this one here. I'm going to have uh, Jennifer actually read that, if you would. So 2 Corinthians 12, 9. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with my weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Thanks. Uh, have you ever felt the scope of your vision uh, and strength of your passion is so great that it over, almost overwhelms you? Um, I have. Sometimes I find myself doubting that I have the ability to see things through, that I have the ability to, to do this uh, right now. Uh, we're, you know, we're not alone in these experiences, these emotions. Historically, uh, there's people throughout the Bible that have been hesitant when, when uh, they felt God's call. Uh, I've actually thought about doing an, another uh, message around that specifically, but uh, trying, like Andy Stanley, tells me to stay on path on track and have, have one, uh, one point out. I, I won't uh, go that dire direction. Um, but, uh, often, you know, many times those same people, uh, they carried out God's plans, even though when the, the odds were greatly stacked uh, against them, you know, they embraced the truth that ultimately it wasn't about them. It's about the one who created them. I love this thought to carry uh, with me when I feel intimidated fear going deeper or get discouraged when I experience a crash or burnout moment. Um, God didn't pick the wrong guy for, for ministry. The devil picked the wrong guy to mess with. So that's, uh, that's, 
something that uh, I always look to when when I feel feel discouraged. Uh, you know, Jennifer mentioned earlier, another way to put it is God doesn't call the equipped. Uh, he equips the called. So that's uh, another great uh, means of, of when you're wrestling things that uh, I use. I'm sure everybody here probably has has their own. I mean, we can talk further about that. But, um, you know, I, I really find strength in remembering that the, that the Lord knew everything about me before I was even born and longed to help me build his kingdom even even then. Um, before I ever thought I'd be here, uh, he chose me. He chose you. Uh, and the peace and fulfillment of that reality can help us choose to be strong and courageous. Knowing that he has equipped us and lives in us to empower us for our calling. Going to take a little different spin now. And I think this will make sense as I look at both sides of, of or looked at two different directions for this, this message. And the Bible of, often talks in counterintuitive statements, different than the normal flow, an unexpected uh, rub against the grain. For example, if you want to gain, you must give up. If someone takes your jacket, give them your shoes too. If you are weak, then we are strong. Tough stuff, good stuff. Uh, stuff that can sometimes leave us scratching our heads though in, in confusion. Because who in their right mind wants to be weak? Yet here we are in 2 Corinthians 12, reading about Paul, Paul and how he is grateful for his weakness. How the very thing that could have tripped him up and caused him to stumble in his faith has become the reason for him to boast now. I bet right now some of you are looking back and can think of that moment. I know I can. Of, co of course, Paul didn't start out celebrating his his weakness we find him pleading with god in second corinthians 12 8 to remove the thorn in his flesh the thing that has left him feeling weak but instead of removing the weakness god speaks into paul's weakness he reminds him my grace is sufficient for you for my power is made perfect in weakness god's power is often found when we shift from begging him to remove our struggles to listening to him speak into our struggle I prayed for God many times to take things out of my life. Oftentimes I prayed the same prayer over and over and over only to find out that what God was trying to tell me, because I went, I didn't listen, is that son, <laughs> I've already, I've, I've already gave you the strength. I've already equipped you to handle this. You have the power. It's time to use it now. You're not letting your you're not you're letting yourself continue down this path without using the tools I've already supplied you with. To me, I look at it this way. For those of you who remember the movie uh, Back to the Future, you remember the character Biff in Marty McFly. So I think about <laughs> God is is Biff. I'm Marty McFly. God's got me in the headlock and he's knocking on my head. Hello, McFly. Hello, McFly. Is anyone there? That was me. You know, it's like, what a knucklehead. <laughs> but how this fills my heart and really sets me free to know that my God is there. God's power is made perfect in my weakness. This doesn't mean I have to push or pretend to even be perfect. He is perfectly able to use less than perfect vessels. The Lord knows I'm one. As a matter of fact, God's quite fond of using weak people, unlikely people. Then he gets all the credit for any good that comes from, <clears throat> excuse me, from our frail and faulty efforts. Then our lives are on display for his glory, not our own. That's why we find Paul boasting. He's able to say, hey guys, this isn't me. All of this good you are seeing in my life, all this power, it's totally the Lord's. Paul goes on to declare in 2 Corinthians 12, 10, that for, for when I am weak, then I am strong. We talk to this point, but I can't help but think, is the opposite true also? When we are strong, then we are weak. What do I mean by that? I mean this. Some things, sometimes our strengths can become our stumbling blocks. Those places when we feel especially invincible and quite able, 
we don't realize that the minute we start feeling absolutely confident in our abilities, the minute we, that's the minute we become desperately weak. All because we make the shift from walking in his power to walking in our own. Ask yourself this, and this is something to keep, keep this in mind. We'll, we'll talk, we'll come back to this, we'll circle back, but think about this as we, as we near wrapping up here. What strengths could easily trip you up today? Where are you needing to re rely, needing to move from relying, I should say, on your own strength to relying on God's strengths? These are certainly questions I'm having to ask myself all the time. God isn't waiting for us to impress him with our strength, and he isn't shaming us because of our weaknesses. He's simply inviting us to surrender every single inadequacy to him so he can fill us with his grace and his strength. Let's allow God to speak into our weakness today. Let's ask him to fill us with grace and strength. And let's grab hold of the truth Paul wants every believer to understand. Our ability is based not, what on, what, not on what we can do. Our ability and strength comes the, from the one who can do all things. So before I close, I want to turn it back over to, to Jennifer to um, one more time to talk to us a little bit about um, what that looks like from her side, her perspective. And Yeah. Okay, thank you. Good job. Um, so to make it a little bit more applicable, Justin's message is I would love for, and if you feel comfortable sharing, if you already know, maybe where your passion and your burden collide to think about that question, but then also to really take a look at what, what either A, do you need, need to surrender? What are some of your strengths that God has, has given you, your birthright talents? And then also what are your growth areas? What are, what are, places of weakness that you need to turn to him or turn over to him, surrender, get help for. Um, and then again, to help you to lead to where do your passion and your burden collide and to pull those, all those things together may start a journey of what God's purpose is for you. So let me, uh, let me summarize the message in this. Freedom is for everybody who, who wants it. The lost, the wounded, those who are weary from striving. It's for those who gave up trying years ago. It's for those who are angry and hurt. It's for those who feel they've been burnt by the church. Friends, you are the church. Um, you're the people of God. You are called by him for a purpose and meant to be free. And with that, I will say amen and thank you all again. <laughs>